You let the situation go, you let the other person go, and you let yourself go. To break a promise, make a place of prayer. No fuss now, just lean into the white brightness, just lean into the white brightness and say what you needed to say all along. As the bird sung above your head, or the water running gently beside you, let your words join one to another the way stone nestles on stone, the way water just leaves and goes to the sea, the way your promise breathes and belongs with every other promise the world has ever made. Welcome to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel, a podcast that illuminates the path to collective healing at the intersection of science and mysticism. In his conversations with visionaries, innovators, artists, and healers, Thomas invites guests into a relational experience that allows inspiration and innovation to emerge. This is The Point of Relation. The following interview was recorded during a previous Collective Trauma Summit, an online gathering convened annually by Thomas Hubel to share ideas and inspire action for healing, individual, ancestral, and collective trauma. Visit CollectiveTraumaSummit.com to listen to featured talks from our most recent summit and sign up to be the first to know when the next summit is announced. David White is the author of 11 books of poetry and four books of prose. He holds a degree in marine zoology and has worked as a naturalist guide in the Galapagos Islands and has led anthropological and natural history expeditions in the Andes, Amazon, and the Himalayas. He works with many European, American, and international companies in the field of organizational development. He is the recipient of two honorary degrees from Newman College in Pennsylvania and Royal Roads University in Victoria, British Columbia. Welcome back to the Collective Trauma Summit 2022. My name is Thomas Hübel. I'm the convener of the summit. And I have the delight and the warm feeling in my heart to welcome you, David. David White is here with us again uh, as a regular guest on our summit. So, David, warm welcome. I'm happy you're here. Uh, it's very good to be here with you, Thomas. Half a world away from you, but uh, uh, in close conversation. Right, right. So every year we we are having our conversation here for the summit, and every year I walk away with a warm heart, like like liquefied by your words. And so it's very, I'm very happy to be here with you again. And since we had already some conversations in the last year, um, I'm curious what's what's so what's unfolding for you. Because as we do our work, every one of us has their leading edge where we find life exciting, yes. where our growth happens. So what's that for you right now? It has to do with uh, giving myself over to a, uh, a really uh, profound sense of, of uh, meeting, actually, and uh, exposure, in a way, to... Uh, um, to the movability of life. I mean, you use this phrase uh, to to liquefy things, to for things to start moving and flowing again. So, uh, especially in my poetry, I'm 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 trying. I'm well. I am writing a lot about the deeper experiences of joy and happiness, and uh, and being overwhelmed by existence in a good way, actually. Um, and uh, the kind of revolutionary uh, everyday miracle that's possible in a human life, and so my a lot of my writing has to do with capturing that. You know, your wa- work has a lot to do with uh, trauma, of course, and uh, most poets would come in through the doorway of trauma in writing, yeah. and. Uh, but that doorway, as you know, is also meant to be a doorway to deeper rewards, to actually to creating an identity which is uh, larger uh, than your traumas, but has not forgotten them, uh, because they're going to be the foundation for your uh, compassion in meeting other people and helping other people. And so it's that edge that I'm that I'm working with. Uh, trying to speak about the ineffable experiences of existence 
that are quite astonishing and hard to speak to. To begin with, we, you know, it's hard to speak to our trauma, uh, uh, but it's perhaps even more uh, difficult to speak to our hidden uh, joys and uh, and enthusiasms. Uh, so uh, that's a great challenge at the moment. Yeah. Mm, that's beautiful. Do you have maybe like a poem or anything that uh, comes from that flow? Like anything that speaks about the uh, joy? Yeah. I've got a good representation uh, um, of it at, uh, with a poem that I wrote at this very desk, actually. Um, just uh, behind the screen here is, uh, are two French doors that look out onto a green, a very green garden in the Pacific Northwest here of the United States. And uh, one Easter morning, I was in here, and the sound of spring in the Pacific Northwest is the sound of the red-winged blackbird. It's a migratory bird here, and it's the most beautiful sound. Every every geographical area of area of the world has its sound of spring. Uh, if there if there's a spring season, and here it's the red-winged blackbird. It's a beautiful sound. And when you hear that, you know spring has arrived. Mm. And I had the door open just as I have now, and I was sitting down to write. And I was I was writing actually. I was in a deep state of in of attention, you know, intentionality and. And suddenly the door behind me opened and my wife appeared with a meditation bell and struck the bell just spontaneously. And uh, and the bell went right through my body sitting at this desk. And at exactly the same time, I heard the red-winged blackbird call. Yeah. Well, this, this was already lodged in my psyche because in the Irish tradition, there's a there's a meme, it's a story of a monk standing at the edge of the monastic precinct and he hears he hears the bell calling him to prayer. And at exactly the same time, he hears the blackbird, a different species of blackbird in Ireland, calling from the other side of the monastic wall. And he hears the bell and he says, that's the most beautiful sound in the world, which is the call to depth and prayer and to enlarging yourself in that silence. But at the same time as he hears the blackbird, he says, and that's also the most beautiful sound in the world, which is just the sound of the world as it is, with no need to change, although it is change itself, you know, but it's just itself. Yeah. And uh and the great, the great underpinning in the psychological underpinning of that story is that the monk doesn't choose actually between the two. He, it's really a meme that represents the human beings as, as that conversation between the two. So here I am sat at the table. I hear the bell. <laughs> I've known this story for years. I hear the bell going right through me. And I hear the blackbird at the same time. And I just started writing. And the poem came out whole. So, so this is it. It's called uh, The Bell and the Blackbird. The sound of a bell still reverberating. The sound of a bell still reverberating, or a blackbird, a blackbird calling from a corner of the field, asking you to wake into this life or inviting you deeper into the one that waits. The sound of a bell still reverberating, or a blackbird, a blackbird calling from a corner of the field, asking you to wake into this life or inviting you deeper into the one that waits. Either way takes courage. Either way wants you to become nothing but that self that is no self at all. Wants you to walk to the place where you find you already know you will have to give every last thing away. The approach that is also the meeting itself. The approach that is also the meeting itself without any meeting at all. That radiance you have always carried with you as you walk both alone and completely accompanied in friendship by every corner of creation crying, Alleluia. Mm. Oh, beautiful. Of course, when you hear that line, that radiance you have always carried with you, uh, many times you say, what radiance? <laughs> Where is that radiance? <laughs> and suddenly it's the experience of the world, you know, that... Uh, that life is difficult and uh, life is suffering. What lies beneath the trouble 
Uh, one of the themes I've been working with this year is uh, is the way we're constantly troubled as human beings, actually. But it's almost always the next dispensation of our life, which is knocking on our door. And we're troubled because we actually don't know how to hold it, how to make ourselves large enough for the understanding. Uh, and I think part of, you know, part, I think part of the the worldwide work on trauma that you're working with is part of enlarging our understanding of ourselves to hold both joy and difficulty at the same time, to hold our troubles, yeah, you know, and the way we've been hurt or violated by life, you know, the way our identity has been broken into at times when without our consent, it seems, yeah. You know. Um and uh and the way that uh, uh, we are essentially vulnerable creatures here. And uh, you can't have any real joyous conversation without the same vulnerability that lays us open to trauma and woundedness and difficulty. Mm. Um, mm. There's, a, there's a Zen koan, you know, a, very, a famous Zen koan by Yunmen, um, where a young monk asks a uh, young man, uh, what about the withered tree in the garden with all the leaves falling from it? And uh, young man says, uh, he says, uh, um, a body with complete exposure to the golden wind. That was his answer. It's a famous answer. Yeah. A body that is completely exposed to the golden wind. And it's really looking at the way that um your present life uh, is really your former life uh, uh, it's already on the way out yeah and uh part of being a whole, able to hold the conversation is to hold the conversation with the seasonality of your existence and the golden wind in that koan koan is the wind of autumn uh, that the colder wind of autumn that takes the leaves from the trees yeah so it's really talking about a beautiful kind of presence and vulnerability, yeah? a body that is, what about the, the withered tree with all the leaves falling in the garden? Uh, a body uh, completely vulnerable, completely exposed to the golden wind. Yeah. That's us as human beings. <laughs> mm. <laughs> mm. So that's part of, that's, uh, part of where I'm writing to at the moment. Mm. That's yeah. beautiful. I love the part about the vulnerability, that the vulnerability is at the same time that which makes us vulnerable to trauma, but it also is that which gives us the deepest meaning, like, and that it's the deepest meaningful relationships and uh, connection to life. It's uh, that openness. Right? And, you know, like, as we already talked in former conversations, like dealing with, when I say collective trauma, I mean also like something that's thousands of years old, that is like life in its more frozen form. And, and a lot of trauma healing is, that's why we call it the liquefaction. It's like allowing that which is frozen to yeah. become fluid again. And yeah. so often when I, when I listen to you, there is, in my experience, I feel like as if in that which is liquid in, in me, I, I deeply enjoy your poetry because I feel I'm joining your stream. When you speak, it's like I'm joining a liquid stream of words because that's so open in you. And maybe you can, you can speak a little bit to the, to the quality of liquidity or what's liquid or what's liquefying and how poetry has in a way the magic of liquefaction. So it, in a way, it's also an amazing uh, aspect of touching the traumatized parts of us. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that movability, you know, that uh, uh, the liquefaction that we experience in the beauty of a falling stream on a rocky hillside yeah, um, is the way that human beings uh, slowly articulate truth. Uh, if you, there's a certain beauty to the way you sometimes finally say to yourself what you need to say, or sometimes 
sometimes you say it to another person, you overhear yourself saying things that you cannot return from. There's a wonderful way in which when you when your voice becomes uh, naturally revelatory, when you start to overhear yourself saying the truth, it's it's like the way water fills up a uh, fills up each uh, each little pond as it moves down a down a mountainside. It fills it to the top, and then it just spills over down into the next uh, pool beneath it, from pool to pool. And uh, there's a kind of invitational, gravitational experience, and it's the same experience we have of going deeper and deeper into our own bodies i think yeah. mm -hmm. i think it's really interesting that the the deeper you get into the silence of the body the more movable it is actually mm -hmm. when we have our identities at the uh in our personalities that we get frozen yeah but what lies beneath the the evolving personality on the on the uh, surface is uh, is something that's like water. I do. <laughs> I remember years ago in the Himalayas, I got uh, I got very very sick. I had a big dysentery. I was in a very remote part of the Himalayas, and uh, and uh, I collapsed really, and I had to be carried into this little hamlet where I was placed in a in a yak manger. It was the only place the family had to put me because the family were about six children, mother and father, all in a single room. And uh, and so they put me out in this manger where the yaks ate the straw from the... And, uh, and so I was in there for three days and three nights. Uh, but on the third day, um, I had, I was hallucinating and... Uh, and I had this experience of my body being the great body, seasonal body of the earth. And I was the I was the water vapor in the sky above the Gaulagiri and Annapurna. Uh, I was the I was the water falling in snow onto the glaciers up there. I was the slow movability of the glacier. I was the melting of the glacier into the streams. I was the stream coming past the house where the little house you know in the manger where i was laid for three days and then i was the marciandi river below that and then i was the ganges and i was the ocean all at once and uh and i had this sudden image of the river going past that we given a name you know we've given a name we give a name to something that's already gone in a way we called it the marciandi and i i suddenly understood myself as this as this moving river, that's I'd been given a name, but actually, what was underneath it was something else. Was this other more enormous cycle? So I sat up in the manger and let out this huge gunshot of laughter. Yeah, you know? and the whole family ran out, and I was raving there and hallucinating, covered in yak straw, and and uh, and uh, and then they all just bowed to me. Actually, they. I think they understood the experience I was having in the, because I was laughing and happy and, and I felt like I was going to die actually too at the same time. So I thought this was my last day. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole David White project seemed completely absurd. You know, it was like, who is this David White guy who was carrying the world on his shoulders, you know? And um, so that was a very, very powerful experience of, uh, movability you're talking about when things start to melt yeah. mm. i have this piece it's called intimate invitation and it's the way that the the inner silence of the body is uh is always calling us it is called intimate invitation i just have to look and i see i just have to listen and i hear I, do not, I need only the slightest desire for anything to find it has already been met right at the center of my body. No need to go anywhere, it seems, and not much to live for, you say, but you forget how you once so, so, saw so clearly the brave outline of a single leaf. You forget how you once saw so clearly the brave outline of a single leaf. You forget 
how you were ravished each morning by the presence of birdsong, how the stream of clouds in the sky seemed to run right through you, and the sun on your skin seemed to pass right through to some inner complexion, and the sun on your skin seemed to pass right through to some inner complexion. How, even when you were stuck without faith, held back and afraid to move, even a little, you could be like the beauty we see in winter ice. Even when you were stuck and without faith, held back and afraid to move, even a little, you could be like the beauty we see in winter ice, just beginning to break and flow. And because, after all this time, you have lived for so long without faith in your own joys and your own grief. And because after all this time you have lived for so long without faith in your own joys and your own grief, you live daily with the loss of every word equal to describing what first brought you into this life and the mercy that hides your journey thereafter. You live daily saying love. You live daily saying love as if it were still far away. You live daily saying love as if it were still far away. Not much to live for, I say. Put down your heavy burden and rest from the hard everyday labor of not hurting or not feeling or not hearing or saying or seeing. Stop keeping the tears at bay. I say, give it all up. Just come home. <sighs> Put down your heavy burden and rest from the hard everyday labor of not hurting or not feeling or hearing or not saying or seeing. Stop keeping the tears at bay, I say. Give it all up. Give it all up. Just come home. Mm. That's very beautiful. Mm. Mm. When you, you said one sentence before that uh, very much stayed with me is when you said, when your voice becomes revelatory. Yes. Or when you're, you know, when what you say becomes revelatory. Yes. And in the, at least in my understanding of trauma is when, when we integrate trauma, <clears throat> we regain the parts of us that were the cause of talking about. Like when something is dissociated and missing, we talk about the world, we talk about ourselves. But in the moment, in the moment that comes back online, we actually speak from it. And that's why every time we, we heal something, our voice becomes fuller and becomes actually exactly as you said, revelatory. Because what we say is not just cognition, it's cognition, sensing, sense making, embodiment. It's all of it being said. And that's so beautiful. And maybe you can speak a little bit more about the revelatory voice. You said when you, when you, say to yourself what you needed to say to yourself, like when you come into a deeper self-contact, your voice uh, reveals. Maybe you can speak. That's very beautiful. Yeah, I do think a good poem or good speech is is listened into the world as much as it's spoken. Uh, right. You're, you're trying to speak to the listening ear. I often, well, I used to, I don't have the, I think the image is more, unconsciously grounded in my body now, but I did used to years ago. Um, when I was writing, I would imagine myself whispering into a loved one's ear uh, in a very, very low voice what needed to be said. And it's that kind of close in whispering, uh, which is uh, enchanting you. Um, into and engendering you into uh into new understandings yeah so uh in a way it's uh it's being it's like being a a good parent to your future self parenting uh the self who's going to live out the days to come in a way uh you are big enough uh you are large enough yeah 
to actually meet uh, the heartbreak uh, that is your path. And uh, we spend a lot of time as human beings, of course, looking for the path where we won't have our heart broken. But <laughs> 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 every path that has any sincerity to it will break your heart. Yeah, you're a, you're following. You're doing a lot of heartbreaking work. Yeah. And the moment you close yourself off from that heartbreak is the moment you stop being actually useful and gifted to other people. You know? The only way we can stop having our heart broken is to decide not to care. Yeah. And of course, that has enormous repercussions on our system because it's only the surface of you that can decide not to care because the inner part of you can't stop caring. But it meets this wall on the outside, uh, or it meets an argument, or it meets reluctance, yeah. And uh, and so, you our only choice really is to have our heart broken around a path that we really care about. Uh, yeah, don't get your heart broken around someone else's path, you know, someone else's work. Yeah, uh, break your heart on something that you care about. And most of us care about other human beings. Uh, so uh, they're there all the time. You know? So the people we choose, yeah, uh, the work that leads us to the right kind of people and to helping in the right kind of way we want to help. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a constant kind of, it's like a musical instrument we're learning how to pr play. Yeah? And uh, there's never an end to the, to the, I mean, I always think, you know, with a good musician, a good musician gets simpler and simpler as the decades go by and uh, in their approach to music. And uh, I think it's the same thing for a human being, you know, with our vocation and our work and, and our way of being is that there's a, there's a necessity for simplicity. And I think, you know, given the, given the difficulties of our times with our massive consumption of resources um we're all contributing to global warming not not just large industries you know in the oil industry we all drive cars we all we all uh use an enormous amount of of energy and packaging and and uh doorway into the future is through simplicity actually and mm. through a joyous simplicity not not a puritanical simplicity, but through learning. I mean, I think one of the things you learn as you as you get older is that uh, is that uh, there's an incredible joy to saying no to so many things that you felt you had to say yes to when you were younger, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that got you into that got you into all kinds of trouble. You know, uh, there's uh, there's a famous book which is called Getting to Yes, and. Uh, I'm thinking of writing a book called Getting to Know. <laughs> 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 Just saying no to uh, to eating too much, you know, to speaking too much, to to needing so much. So uh, just a beautiful no to it, to allow something else to arise uh, that's much simpler, that needs less input, uh, that needs less resources, yeah. And... Uh, uh, so that's uh, certainly uh, a theme. I think that's a necessity for humankind at the moment, um, because uh, <clears throat> our present our present um, goals are still around increasing every input and every output, and it's not. We all know it. The game is up. You know, uh, the game is up, and uh, it's just not sustainable. So that's a trauma. That's a trauma for us. Is uh, the world we thought we were given is not actually not the world we live in, you know? and uh, and the promises that were made to us and that we've made to ourselves. I often think that the critical junctures of of maturation in human life are around are around giving up on old, outworn promises. When you think about it, we're promise-making animals. We're we're constantly making promises to other people and to ourselves. Yeah, and um, and there's a whole shibboleth around breaking of promises. You know, they're taboo around breaking promises. But when you think about it, 
human beings have to creatively dismantle and liquefy, as you would say, pro old promises that are outworn from the season in which they in which they took place. If you think about it, the promises you make over the cradle of a newborn child are are really powerful. And they're almost always to do with complete and utter protection around that child. Yeah? And they're good promises because they're made in the seasonal, in seasonality of utter physical vulnerability on the part of that child. Yeah? But if you were keep, to keep to that promise when they were 13, 14, or 15, around complete protection, you would ruin the child. Yeah? And of course, there are lots of childhood lives that are ruined through that overprotection and overcontrol. Yeah? from a, an outworn promise that was made in a good place. So the ability to let go of the promise. I think um, I found myself in this beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, fishing chapel, um, which is part of a, a set of monastic ruins on the side of the River Kong that runs between Loch Mask and Loch Corrib in Connemara, actually on the edge of Connemara. And uh, this, ru this these ruined buildings are so beautiful, but the most beautiful structure of all is this stone chapel with an old fireplace in it where the roof has gone. And there's, a, there's an opening in the floor where the monks used to drop their fishing lines down yeah, or their net. And apparently there was a bell attached to the net and when the bell rang, you had a fish, yeah. Or if, if you know anything about fishing, the bell rang and you almost had a fish. <laughs> you did. <laughs> was gone. But I've often thought it would be a beautiful place to be in there of a winter's evening with another monk ca catching up on the monastic gossip. But even more powerfully, if you were in by yourself, yeah, with this fireplace and and this slot in the floor with a river running beneath, yeah. And that would be a very prayerful place. And it's really remarkable, actually, the way that some buildings are actually much more beautiful as a ruin than they ever were in their heyday. And, and, and the wall that faces downstream has fallen away. The roof has gone and, the, and one wall. So there's three walls now, fireplace, slot in the floor, three walls. And then you're looking downstream. You're looking at everything that is flowing away from you, just as I was in the manger in the little hamlet in the Himalayas all those years ago. And I was in there, and I was in a difficult relationship at the time. And I was looking at everything that was already gone. And I realized that I'd made a promise that was static. Yeah. I'd made a promise to this other person. And although the promise was good when I made it, it was actually imprisoning both that person and myself. Yeah. And the interesting thing was I'd never said the promise out loud. But I might as well have shouted it from the rooftops because it was so powerful. So in that little fishing chapel, I said to myself, how do you break a promise? Yeah. How do you do it in a good way? Because there's so much in the literature around, around making promises, but so little around breaking promises. Yeah. But so many of the ways we get stuck around old traumas are around promises we've made of complete defense against anything like that happening again. Yeah. Which would mean means we stop almost everything coming in. Yeah. So this is the piece I wrote. It's called To Break a Promise. Yeah. And I think it's a kind of crucial step in, in not only letting go of old promises, but letting go of old wounds and difficulties. Yeah. Mm. You let the situation go, you let the other person go, and you let yourself go. To break a promise, make a place of prayer. To break a promise, make a place of prayer. No fuss now, no fuss now. Just lean into the white brightness. Just lean into the white brightness and say what you needed to say all along. Break a promise, make a place of prayer. No fuss now. No fuss now, just lean into the white brightness and say what you needed to say all along, nothing too much. Words as simple and as yours and as heard as the bird sung above your head or the water running gently beside you 
Let your words join one to another the way stone nestles on stone, the way water just leaves and goes to the sea, the way your promise breathes and belongs with every other promise the world has ever made. Now let them go on. Let your words have their own life without you. Let the promise go with the river. Stand up. Walk away. Have faith. Let your words join one to another the way stone nestles on stone, the way water just leaves and goes to the sea, the way your promise breathes and belongs with every other promise the world has ever made. Now let them go on. Let your words have their own life without you. Let the promise go with the river. Stand up. Walk away. Have faith. Mm. There was a lovely uh, merciful sense to that stand up, walk away, have faith. Because as I walked away, I said to myself, you know, if the promise is still real, it will just come back to you. You won't be able to give it away, actually. So you can't lose, actually. So <laughs> just try giving away a few of the promises that you think are, are taboos in your life. Yeah? And uh, almost always, uh, they will come back to you in a different way if they do come back, you know you'll be holding them more lightly. But if you've got yourself into a fishing channel uh, chapel on a January day for an hour and a half, almost all, always you probably need to let the promise go. <laughs> 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 let the promise go with the river. Stand up, have faith, walk away. <clears throat> so uh, it's lovely. It's been a it's been an invitation to investigate promises in my life ever since. You know what? Especially what unconscious promises am I living that I've I've never actually said them out loud, but I might as well have written them in blood, you know, the way they keep me held in place. You know? And quite often they're just the person who made that promise actually isn't there anymore. Yeah. And the people for whom it was made, other than you, are not there in the same way. Yeah. Let the promise go with the river. Stand up, walk away, have faith. That's very powerful, David. I'm sorry, but there's so many things that we could uh, lead this into. Um, but one thing, uh, if you if you look at for a moment at the collective situation, and we say we are in a moment right now. I think there are many collective promises. I think anyway, like we are in a time where the world's getting more liquid. And many things are in a change process. And I think the the place that you spoke about, the revelatory voice, is also a place where we find like a connection to the movement. Also, when you speak about the river, like the river is a connection to that movement. And if you feel comfortable in the river, then we can join the current change movement. But some things have to be dissolved, fall apart. Many promises, I think, that we yes. yeah. gave each other are subject to liquefaction right now. And that's, that's sometimes painful, especially when there's trauma around the promises. And that's why we can't let it go. And the, the pain comes back when we dismantle the promises. And I'm wondering, also given, you know, we're at the edge of a cliff where we don't see the world to come yet. But we feel the world uh, is liquefying around us, and it might be a scary moment. And also, given climate change, as you said, it's not sustainable if we all continue that consumption. So, what when you speak a bit into this time, like what are the collective promises that we are uh, maybe that we have to let go, even if it's painful? in order to liberate ourselves into the next iteration. Yes, I think it's um, you know, part of the unconscious promises as the, uh, the, the way we've uh, promised we would stay true to our old communities in a way, and where the borders and boundaries of those communities lay. And, um, and every boundary and... Uh, and frontier is being broken down at the moment. Uh, it's why we're so uh, 
collectively disturbed by migration of peoples who are not of our same culture, you know, uh, into our into our uh, countries. Yeah, um, everywhere you go, there's this um, falling away of the very community that we grew up with as a child that we recognized. Yeah, that we have to let go. So we part of it is this is this invitation to a greater generosity about what makes up my human community. And the good part of this breaking down is that uh, we have to work together. And despite the war in Ukraine, despite Putin and Russia and and all the rest right now, um, it's just something we can't turn our face away from. That acceleration of of having to work together, uh, both for practical necessity, but also for a greater unconscious reason in the future um, around human harmony and understanding of of the beauties of of diversity and the, all the constellation, differing constellation of elements that make up human life around the world being brought together. You know, um, that process is accelerating. We're just in a temporary one step back. We're, I think we're just confronting all our different forms of reluctance right now. Uh, when you think about it, I, <laughs> I often say, you know, we think about, uh, about self-knowledge as being my understanding, my virtues and powers and the way I bring those gifts out into the world. But, but self-knowledge is as much to do with understanding all the ways that you don't want to have the conversation, thank you very much. You know, all the ways you are reluctant to be here, yeah. Reluctant to have to deal with the bills, to have to deal with constant conversations with people not being there when you want when you want them. You know, we're we're very reluctant to show up actually. So it really it's really quite amusing and instructive actually to look for a day just at all the ways you are reluctant to be in your life (laughs) 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 and the way you know if you have dogs the way you're reluctant to be a dog owner (laughs) 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 if you're in a marriage the way you're reluctant to be a husband or a wife or a partner you know and it's not an indulgence it's actually emancipating you and allowing you both to have a sense of humor about it but also to be honest about the times when you need more alone time uh, or you need certain aspects of uh, of of aloneness in your life you know um if you're reluctant to have conversations every part of the day it's because you need actually more silence in your life you know? so the so that you can be allowed to get hungry for conversation you know? mm. uh so uh what's the uh do i understand the measure and depth of my own reluctance to be here because life is difficult. You know, life will break your heart. Uh, life is full of people disappearing and uh, illness and and goodbyes. Yeah. So every human being has the right not to want to be here in a way. Uh, we have that birthright part of us. Yeah. That understands how difficult even the most ordinary life is to live yeah how difficult it is to love uh in under certain under so many different kinds of circumstances you know and all the different forms of love that we're invited into they're all forms of being exposed to that golden wind that i uh uh that yunman spoke to earlier yeah so so I I do think that as a collective we're actually looking at our at our communal reluctance to take the next step and uh we're getting a bit of a throwback into our uh, into our past you know with a uh an autocratic figure from the second world war almost in the form of putin yeah and uh and fights that shouldn't be taking you know battles that are just a waste of time really they're necessary of course if you're ukrainian but uh, they're really wasting a lot of time. <laughs> this, when, uh, <clears throat> but that's the way we change. I think we take one step back and two steps, two two steps forward.
And mm-hmm. for short periods of time, we take two steps back and one step forward. Yeah. I love the collective reluctance, I think. And also what you said, it's very important that we have a right to be reluctant, that the right to not feel, you know, because I often say trauma, like another word of tra- a way to say trauma is that here, it's not good for me. Yes. You know, here in this space and time moment, in the traumatic moment, it's no good for me. So moving out somewhere is better than being here. That's why in all the presencing work, if I don't understand the intelligence of not being here, I will always get stuck on my spiritual path because I force myself to be more present versus being, as you said, everybody has a right not to be here because that's sometimes more intelligence than being here. Yes. And, and being here means feeling, being present to the experience. Sometimes zoning out is has to happen. And I think if we develop exactly this sensitivity that we said that we have a right to be collectively reluctant or absent, but we create an awareness of it. And in the respect, we can be come more engaged again because we are not fighting against this mechanism but we're actually honoring that mechanism and bringing love to it embracing it yes. and then we can melt back into what was formerly so difficult yes. yeah it's beautiful i think that's very well said thomas yeah well said mm-hmm. yeah i mean it just if you allow yourself to be honest about the way you're reluctant to be all the ways you're reluctant to be in your relationship, for instance. Yeah. It allows you to understand the way that your spouse or your partner might be reluctant also. You, mm-hmm. know, but, uh, <laughs> you can actually laugh about it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Of course, yeah, I feel I feel the same. So you can she doesn't or he doesn't have to be anything other than themselves. Yeah. And um and uh, uh you meet the person with all their their wishes not quite to be here. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons so many young men, especially, I mean, both young men and women, but especially young men are caught up in the world of video games. Yeah. Uh, because here you can restart the game. You know, if you die, you can actually restart the game and you can buy those extra life points or buy the cloak of invisibility so that you can't be found. They're all and uh you have ult- you have a sense of ultimate control or the illusion of that you can uh you can manipulate all of these parts of the of the world that you're involved with through the video game unlike your actual life yeah where you have to pay tremendous attention and and the conversation is deepened through vulnerability yeah rather than having power over uh, yeah, so uh, mm-hmm. we're losing, you know, we're losing the gifts of a lot of young men, I think, caught up in video gaming, unfortunately. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with video gaming as a, like any hobby or anything, but it's it's addictive nature is really very, very bad. Yeah. And the way that it uh, actually starts to shape your personality around manipulation, protection and calculating the odds all the time yeah Mm, yeah, very deep i I see this also as one of the more collective trauma symptoms like the addiction process that you're describing um i've just been having a few new thoughts on addiction actually which is uh addiction in many ways is the way we stop the process of maturation um it's something we take on to stop something from happening and that then takes on a life of its own. Mm-hmm. But we got into that addiction because we got afraid of the way we were maturing and the vulnerability that comes that comes with it. Yeah. Uh, this is a new line of thought for me that I'm just pursuing. I've only just begun thinking that way. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Maybe this is also connected to one one theme that I would love to look into and maybe also see if there's any kind of poetic response to that. When in a community somebody is missing 
or goes missing. Yes. It's the responsibility of the community to go to look for the one who is missing. Like if there's somebody buried under an avalanche, so we need to go to look. That's a healthy response. And in the in the collective trauma work, I see a lot of like that the deepest pain is not the pain that screams. The deepest pain is the pain that is frozen, is mute doesn't have cameras, is not being heard, doesn't have a word, like it has no creation through the word. And it's kind of muted. And I believe that everybody who has a certain level of awareness of the culture also has a responsibility to detect who's missing. Because actually yeah. many deeply hurt people are missing in their hurt. You cannot even yes. hear the hurt, but it's still, it's very active, but it's mute. And, and also the highest exaggeration of stress is freeze. So we are simply frozen and shocked. And if that shock stays, then life seems to go on, but the part of that person got frozen in time. And, and I'm wondering, because I think the most of life energy in our, in our culture also, and in, in individuals is locked in that mute pain and i'm i'm wondering because i'm sure that there is something in your own exploration even if you name it differently that um that speaks to the the one who is missing the one who is mute the one who is only looking but not speaking anymore where we don't even sometimes recognize that we meet people that are in heavy distress or pain, but we don't recognize it because it's not screaming. It's frozen. So maybe you can speak a little bit to that theme. Um, well, first of all, I'll just uh, say it's beautifully articulated, Thomas. And uh, what led you to this? What led you into this theme at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, because I see often that when I when I engage in in the in the deep collective trauma work, I see often that uh, also in people in large groups how the deepest pain is the one that I really need to listen for, that I need to look for, because it's not coming to me. As long as it can speak, it's anyway coming somehow. People express something, but they are always a certain amount of people that carry a deep pain, but they are not coming forward. You know, they are not speaking. And so my responsibility is to, to actively listen and look for that which is missing. And, and I think that that, pa that part of our society needs to be strengthened because like that we will, first of all, be of incredible support, but also regain a lot of life's resources that are frozen in the permafrost of, of our cultures. You know, there's like, there's a lot of pearls in, in the ice. There are a lot of yes. pearls in the ice. Yes. And so every time I see this and I see how deeply wounded and the, and the deeply wounded are quiet. I saw it as I was, while I studied, I worked as a volunteer for the Red Cross as a paramedic. And I, and it's very clear for a paramedic that you go there first where some, where somebody is quiet, not where somebody screams. Because the people that are quiet are usually more endangered. Like they are, they are in a more, in a higher emergency than the ones that are screaming. And, and, and that, and I saw it in many people that I saw as a paramedic in shocked states. And so like when, when somebody is really hurt, it's like quite, it looks like kind of okay sometimes, you know, because people are just sitting somewhere and it's, it doesn't look like a big drama, but these people are often in, in severe inner states. And yeah, so that's what, that led me to it. And I'm always looking how can we as also conscious communities be the ones who look for the ones that are missing. Yeah. You know, that are Beautiful. amongst us, but missing. Yes. Well, you know, it's very close to the uh, underlying dynamic of writing poetry, actually, and why poetry is so damn difficult to write. Good poetry. Um, you tend to be on, you 
you tend to be under the illusion that you're um, you're going to find this part of you that will speak the truth, beautiful truth into the world. But actually, you're trying to find the part of you that cannot speak. And that's that's the part of you that's going to write the poetry, actually. Mm-hmm. So it's exactly the same phenomenon. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. Course, when you do that, of course, then you speak on behalf of so many people who cannot speak in exactly the same way. Exactly. Yeah, so they hear the voice. Yeah, yeah. And I have this piece I wrote uh, for a friend who needed to leave uh, the situation he was in. And he now has left the situation, but it took him a long time to get there. Um, Partly because he didn't didn't believe he deserved the life he could have if he left it. And of course, it's that part of him that couldn't speak. Mm -hmm. Um, The part of him that somehow was traumatized through a certain kind of emotional imprisonment but was afraid of actually releasing himself from that confinement. So this is called, uh, you know when it's time to go. Uh, we all know the way that we uh, will stay with the traumas that we're familiar with, uh, the emotional difficulties that we're familiar with, because that's what constitutes our world. That's the world we're familiar with. Yeah. Uh, and you don't know who you'd be if you were if you were actually without them. That's actually frightening. It's a frightening open open horizon that you quite often don't feel you deserve in many ways. Mm-hmm. So this is called uh, you know when it's time to go. You know when it's time to go. That involuntary sense of hesitation discovered inside what only looks like your own body. You know when it's time to go. That involuntary sense of hesitation discovered inside what only looks like your own body. A hesitation like a movement in itself. Your reluctance to hear the call as much an invitation as if a door had opened in the broad heavens and called you through. Your reluctance to hear the call as much an invitation as if a door had opened in the broad heavens and called you through. Your unwillingness to hear the bird song, another kind of listening. Your unwillingness to hear the bird song, another kind of listening, and the complete inability to speak such a clear and articulate understanding of what you want. And your com- and the complete inability to speak such a clear and articulate understanding of what you want. Even in the midst of thinking you will never be ready, even when you feel you've never deserved that freedom to go, even under the comforting illusion that you never had a single speck of faith in what you want, you've already packed your silent reluctance away, lifted your ear to the morning bird song, and before anyone can wake, you're out the door, down the road, round the corner, and on your way. Hmm. The complete inability to speak such a clear and articulate understanding of what you want. Even in the midst of thinking you'll never be ready, even when you feel you've never deserved that freedom to go, even under the comforting illusion that you never had a single speck of faith in what you wanted, you've already packed your silent reluctance away, lifted your ear to the morning bird song, and before anyone can wake, you're out the out the door, down the road, round the corner, and on your way. Mm. Oh, that's really beautiful. But, uh, I mean, that complete inability to speak, that's interesting that you're you're listening for that in your work, actually. The place where it's not being, it's not being said and not being, not being spoken. Um, and uh, I do think that maturation has to do with inviting in all of these parts of ourselves that we've we've pushed out into the cold yeah and uh having them live under under one roof together yeah or mm-hmm. under one sky perhaps is a more accurate description mm-hmm. So I think uh, that's certainly part of uh the difficulty of our times I mean it, it's interesting that one of the great themes of our time uh, is the weather, which just breaks across all human boundaries within a day. You know, 
a weather system can move through five or six countries in Northern Europe in, a, in the course of 24 hours, uh, bringing, bringing with it whatever it brings, this collective experience and in, increasingly more and more traumatic experiences of the uh the fierceness of the of the weather um i think i think it is a in a way it's a beautiful collective unconscious um invitation for mm -hmm. us to break down those boundaries ourselves yeah. very much so and i love also the when you speak about our maturation because i very much see this that that part of our learning that we that is frozen in the trauma we couldn't harvest yet like we we couldn't integrate that learning if you just look at the holocaust or like massive transgressions of any kind of human rights like we we didn't open that in us as millions and millions of people to really allow the feeling to come back like the embodiment and to harvest that pearl of ethical learning in order, for example, to deal with AI or nanotechnology or whatever, what we are inventing now. And I believe that gap, that some that part of our ethical learning is frozen in the ice, but we are developing like technologies mm -hmm. where we need that ethical understanding to match consciousness and technology. But in a way, part is frozen. And I think that's exactly the maturation that you speak about. We have to harvest that. We have to integrate that in order to become mature enough to meet our skills on other, you know, science, technology, as you said, also video gaming or digitalization. This needs like a maturity to meet it. Yes. Uh, obviously, you when you work with a lot of individuals as part of collective trauma, and you see, yeah, I'm sure you've witnessed a lot of healing. What kind of uh, in in individuals? Uh, what kind of healing are you witnessing collectively in your work? Where where do you see reason for what most people would call hope um, around uh, around the way things are? Uh, are crystallizing right now yeah what i see is like when 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 we as people make deep experiences that because i deeply believe in in the power of the interdependence that the individual and the collective are not two but they're actually one expression so we are not separate from the collective but we we are the we have a collective self and an individual self that's once it's one and um and whenever we harvest in groups, even when we deal with very difficult, like for example, the Holocaust or, or racism or colonialism or violent, gender violence, and but the group becomes this witnessing power uh, when somebody shares or somebody goes to something and hundreds or thousands of people are like a hub for it. This gives such a tremendous um collective experience of togetherness in the pain and togetherness in the growth in both in the liberation and also in the deep pain that we are facing i think that creates um, a new priming of of an experience of collective that is centered around healing honesty authenticity you know relationality attunement resonance and and these kind of collective hubs, I believe, are the healing modality of now. Yeah. Like we need that because that speeds up individual healing a lot. And the individual healing helps collective insights to emerge through us. And, and I had many groups around, for example, the integration of Nazi Germany and, and uh, Jewish people in the room and and the, the deep pain that is in there but what almost all the time happened was that there was such a nakedness and we could really feel the uh, like a deep support of a deeper presence that enabled things that are amazing literally amazing and i think that that's what i call the arising of the collective witness 
then when we are not anymore looking just as individuals at each other, but when we we form like an orchestra, you know, together, and we are collectively witnessing as much as we are still individually feeling and participating. And that collective witness has a tremendous power. And that's what I find very hopeful because I often say a small cup, so much water, but thousands of cups hold much more water. And in the spiritual practice, we always talk about how to increase the cup so that more light can be channeled through it. Yeah. And, and I think collectives are collective cups. And then the pain is relatively smaller than when a small cup faces it. And that's, that's what I call deeply hopeful. Marvelous. Yeah. And of course, this uh, conference is part of that work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The, and also our our relation and our conversation and you being part of this net and that we have a resourcing network of many people doing incredible work already, like that's a bigger cup, you know, that's... Uh, and I see, as you said by yourself, I see poetry. That's why I love our conversations because you said before that the unspeakable feels spoken to through poetry. And through art, and I and I think that's why I was I was walking through the biennial in Venice just a, three weeks ago, immersed like I had such a deep joy being immersed in the in the you know one of the most famous art art, art exhibitions in the world, and seeing leading edge art from all around the world, and it's 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 similar to my experience with you is like that there I think it's such an important contribution to to liquefy in this creative space things that cannot be said otherwise you know yeah. they yeah they don't reach us when they are being said just through academic words or something they need to no. go to the heart I remember when I lost my mother and uh I'd uh I'd no idea, you know, what a, a, an unconscious part of my foundation, foundational identity my mother was until she was gone. You know? And so um, it opened this, up this doorway of writing. And uh, I wrote intensively for six months, lots of poems about my mother and memories of my mother and, and my mother's identity. Um, um, not as a mother, you know, as a person who just happened to be a mother, but who had a much larger identity than one I could name during during my life as her firstborn son. You know? And I remember after six months, I, I, I just was so thankful to poetry that it had allowed me to, I said, I've done seven years of work, actually, through writing for six months here, seven years of grief, yeah. Mm. And uh, I always think that the only cure for grief is grief itself. Grief is its own cure. Yeah, that's the only way. <laughs> the only way you get through grief is just by grieving. Yeah? And uh, so it's a beautiful form of articulation and grieving and letting go of her at the same time. Mm. And the strange uh, sense that actually, if there was something, if there was an afterlife, you know, uh, she was on to other things, actually, and she'd left us all behind, uh, which is very difficult for the firstborn son of an Irish mother to confront. You know, <laughs> you might not be the center of the world. <laughs> that she was, <laughs> that she, was uh, she was actually off, you know, and she was letting herself go and letting me go at the same time. You know? um, so through this beautiful troubledness, this sense of woundedness, yeah. um, this uh, this full exposure to the golden wind, you know, what, what has been taken away from you. Yeah. Uh, you find you have that golden wind inside yourself too, you know, that can also ruffle the branches of, uh, of other people, people's trees at the same time in a good way. Um, it's very touching because uh, that you that you brought this up here now because my mother just passed away seven days ago. Oh and, my God, yeah, yes. And uh, it's touching me how you speak about poetry, like how it's 
It's, uh, that that was a way how to deal with it. And I like what you said, that grief is its own, is its own remedy. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I really feel like I got to know uh, my mother as uh, uh, not as a mother, actually, as a person uh, who was much larger than than any name we'd all given her. Yeah. Like working with the essence of who was speaking to you, and uh, and so I do recommend it uh, if you do uh, put pen to paper. And there's all kinds of, I, I, um, I had this experience after my mother had gone. We all have those experiences, very ancient dynamic, you know, of the bird at the window uh, in the morning or seeing a rainbow in a distance and feeling as if you've been spoken to, yeah. And I kept having these dreams that I was just about to find out where my mother was, yeah. And, uh, and uh, I'd be told, you know, uh, and then it wouldn't happen. You know, I'd wake up and, the revelation had not been given to me. <laughs> and I had this culminating dream. I was at the cottage in Yorkshire with my, my father was in another room. It was after my mother had gone. And, and, uh, and I, I was sat on my mother's bench at the back door by her roses. She used to grow roses uh, by the back doors. It was her favorite place to sit. And, uh, and I had an envelope in my hand with the sunlight falling out of it. And in the dream, I knew it was from my mother. And I knew that if I opened it up, I would know everything about where my mother was from this, from this letter. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was just opening the letter when I woke up, of course. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so of course, I tried to go back to sleep, put my head in the same pillow to get back into the dream. But you know, <laughs> to the letter. So mm. I said, listen, David, uh, go to the kitchen table now. It was very early in the winter's morning. I go to the kitchen table, you know what your mother would say to you, yeah. and write write the letter from your mother to you. Yeah. So uh, somewhere in here I have that. Um, it's called Farewell. It's called Farewell Letter. I'll, I'll read this poem for you having just lost your mother, mm. Thomas. Yeah. Thank you. Farewell Letter. She wrote me a letter after her death. She wrote me a letter after her death. And I remember a kind of happy light falling on the envelope as I sat by the rose tree on her old bench at the back door, so surprised by its arrival, wondering what she would say, looking up before I could open it and laughing to myself in silent expectation. Dear son, it is time for me to leave you. I'm afraid that the words you are used to hearing are no longer mine to give. They're gone and mingled back in the world where it is no longer in my power to be their first original author, nor their last loving bearer. You can hear motherly words of affection now only from your own mouth and only when you speak them to those who stand motherless before you. You can hear motherly words of affection now only from your own mouth, and only when you speak them to those who stand motherless before you. As for me, I must forsake adulthood and be bound gladly to a new childhood. You must understand this apprenticeship demands of me an elemental innocence from everything I ever held in my hands. I know your generous soul is well able to let me go. You will in the end be happy to know my God was true. And I find myself, after loving you all for so long, in the wide, infinite mercy of being mothered myself. P.S. All of your intuitions were true. Mm. Well, that's very beautiful. Yeah. I had this sense that my mother was in a new childhood when my mother had lost her own mother when she was 13. And she became a mother to her her siblings to her daughters and and then the church in the bad old island broke the family apart and she had to flee to england when she was 15 you know so i had this feeling that she was uh she was meeting her own mother again yeah and she was being and she was giving herself over to the last part of the childhood that she'd never had herself yeah. 
I know your generous soul is well able to let me go. You will in the, in the, end, in the end be happy to know my God was true. And I find myself, after loving you all for so long, in the wide, infinite mercy of being mothered myself. P.S. All of your intuitions were true. A beautiful koan at the end on trust my mother to leave me with, wait a minute, what were my intuitions? <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, were you with your mother when she passed away? No. no, I couldn't because it was very fast, so I, I just could fly. I arrived the morning after. Right? Yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but we were in a good, we were in a very good relation. There was a lot of love nice. between us, yeah. but you still, so. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. I always say the, uh, when you lose someone, the conversation doesn't stop. And it carries on maturing, actually. Yeah. And uh, you see new aspects. I had this rather close theologian, uh, poet friend, John O'Donoghue, and I feel like our... He died now. Uh, he died now, thirteen years ago, or so, fifteen years ago. And I feel like our relationship—it was so intense while we were alive, but I feel like it's still going on and maturing, and new understandings about each other. And I had the same thing with my mother. That I—I ac I actually came into a deeper friendship with my mother after she'd gone, and. Uh, uh, because the the gravitational field of motherhood is so powerful, you know, and we grew up in it, uh, and uh, and we're quite, we're quite helpless. And I remember when I went away to university, I my mother was a very good cook, and I and uh, but I never lifted a finger in the kitchen at home, you know, until I got to university and suddenly said, "Wait a minute, nothing's going to happen unless I do it." <laughs> so I started. I started cooking, you know, and I became very good in the kitchen cooking, and I still love cooking. But if I went home, it was just as if someone had cut my spinal cord. You know, I would sit in the chair. I, I physically could not do anything in my mother's kitchen. The gravitational pull of everything she'd done and provided was just too... It was just as if I was returned to into this... You know, into this... Powerful uh, substrate of belonging that I'd grown in, and so you know the the beautiful gifted part of death is this, as you say, this sudden movability of everything. Uh, yeah, and even to let go of the word mother, which is so powerful in and of itself, yeah, in every language, yeah. uh, mother, muta, yeah. Madre, yeah. so God, it's so, such a beautiful word in every language. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's beautiful to be in this space with you, David. And thank you for uh, reading that poem. me. And um, I see, wow, well, our time is already so progressed. And uh, I deeply enjoy the space that we dive into again and again. So now I walk away with a a warm heart and so connected to you and yes i look forward to some some uh, corner of the world in the future where we can have a live conversation again as we did yeah that time. would be we really lovely. together in the same room yeah yeah i think our path will cross again also physically and uh, you're such a great contribution to the summit I, I love what you bring in your unique way to the summit it's very essential so yeah, very kind thomas well uh, feeling is reciprocated yeah the same warmth so thank you very much god bless and i wish you well in your uh, deepening conversations with your with your mother uh, mm, that's indeed what i'm having at the moment yeah, yeah. Thank you, David. It was so beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, Keep well. Yeah. Yes. Job. You too. Yeah. I'm looking forward to the next time. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. Bye now. Visit CollectorTraumaSummit.com to listen to more talks like this one and to sign up and be the first to know when the next Collector Trauma Summit is announced. Thanks for listening to Point of Relation with Thomas Hubel. Stay connected and get updates about new episodes by visiting our website, pointofrelationpodcast.com, and by subscribing to the Thomas Hubel YouTube channel. 
If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share about us with your community on social media. Thank you. We appreciate your support.